everybody. Uh, good morning and welcome uh, to the Department of Innovation and Performance. Um, we are very excited today to see the final presentation um, from a group of uh, students from the Pitt School of uh, Information Science uh, who have done a really exciting project this year where they've helped us to evaluate uh, PittsburghPA.gov and all the ways that it communicates um, and all the ways that we're taking in uh, information from our departments and distributing it to, the, to our citizens. Um, so they have looked at the website from a variety of very exciting angles and so we are excited now to uh, go through their findings. So with that, let me pass it off to the Pitt students. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Jacqueline Ramsey. I was the project uh, lead uh, for this particular project. We put together a pretty uh, robust team of students from uh, the university along with our advisors. And uh, today we're going to cover a number of different points. Uh, first, we're going to start with data analytics to show you what's been happening in the past. Um, and then we're going to move on to user experience and the uh, surveys and such uh, research that we've done for you. Uh, then we'll move on to your social media accounts, and then we'll cover uh, content management and governance, and then finally we'll cover content architecture, which will also include a uh, wireframe. With that, I'll pass it on to the data analytics team, which is uh, Tyler Brooks and uh, Andrew. Thank you, Jackie. So I'm Tyler Brooks and this is Andrew. Actually, you can come up here, Andrew. We'll be talking about our findings in, for data analytics. So first off, uh, what we did was essentially take the Google Analytics that uh, your website has been employing, we took a subset of that over the course of a year, January 1st to January 1st, and we uh, made several reports highlighting our findings. And we're gonna go over four of the reports that Andrew and I put together over the course of this semester and some of the highlights and observations we made. Uh, we used Tableau, which is a, a visualization software, to create the majority of the visualizations that you'll see in this presentation and in the reports. So our first report is a user outcomes report. And this is kind of like a user story report, but in this case, the outcomes are landing pages. So for instance, uh, if you navigated to the Shenley Cinema in the Park, that is a, a city park's outcome. If you went to slash fire or slash police, that's a, a public safety outcome. And the point of this, these categories is to kind of figure out what content on the page is most important to the users. And we use this report to show what content is being accessed the most. And we can also infer some behaviors based on actions when visiting those pages. So the main thing we drew from this report is a, a clear view of what content is important to the users. Uh, we found that 5% of all the subpages drive 80% of all website traffic. And in addition to that, 10% of all the subpages drive 90% of all the website traffic. And what this is saying is that you could eliminate 90% of your website's web pages and still receive 90% of your traffic. Um, and we can see that city parks and public safety together account for over a third of your entire website traffic. And then these remaining five categories are another third. And then there uh, are uh, 13 other categories that constitute the other 80% uh, or so, or 30%, sorry. So that, that was the main observation we made from this. And we have uh, other observations we made for each report, uh, but we only included the most important ones for each report. So if you're more interested in other observations we made, you can see the reports for more details. So next, we essentially analyzed what search terms people were using the most. Um, and we can tell, using different statistics about the search terms, which search, ter search terms were more successful, uh, as in which ones directed people to their desired content the fastest and which ones weren't. And we also compared it to how those search terms aligned with Ask Pittsburgh topics. So what we found is that top searches revolve around tax services, permits, or refuse. Um, the average search depth is close to one page, which means that when users click on a search link, they go to a page and they leave, which implies that they're actually finding the content that they're looking for. It, it might mean this isn't search refinement, so they might have searched six times until they found a web page they liked, but they were able to find the page eventually. So that's, that's something good. Um, what we did find is that we 
we believed that Ask Pitchford was supposed to kind of line up with what people were interested in finding on the website. And um, in our report, we note that the Ask Pittsburgh topics don't necessarily line up with the search terms or the top content. So we'll go more into how we can align these findings with creating metrics that you can use to drive things like your Ask Pittsburgh topics. So I will hand over to Andrew, who will go over the remaining reports. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, so the next report is a social media traffic channel report. And what we wanted to do here was analyze um, how much traffic was actually being driven from social media. Uh, what those social media uh, redirects were doing, and then um, ultimately what kind of content from these specific social media sites uh, these users were looking at. So what we found was, surprisingly, um, social media only drives 6.5% of traffic to the website uh, in the, the year time period. Uh, so that can be represented here by this blue bubble. We've also found that uh, it had a, a pretty high bounce rate of 85.33%. Um, and that the average page, pages per session uh, was 1.4. So we have seen that, you know, upon looking at the actual content that was driving a lot of the traffic, the majority of the redirects were public safety articles and Office of the Mayor releases. Uh, additionally, uh, some of the other more popular landing sites were Cinema in the Park and the 311 Response Center. Uh, so one thing that we did see um, across almost pretty much all of the data is that there was a, a very low pages to session ratio, ratio and a high bounce rate. Um, so what, this, what we kind of infer from this is that in most cases what a, a social media user is, is going to do is they go and they access the website to, uh, via the direct link, they read the article, and they subsequently end their session. So they're not doing much browsing past uh, the initial article that ultimately led them to the website. Uh, the next report we, we uh, made was a mobile usage report. And in this case, what we did is we compiled statistics on all of uh, the 20 subcategories that we previously defined. And uh, the statistics were centered on mobile usage as well as mobile compared to uh, desktop usage. So what we found in this report was that uh, overall mobile usage um, on average was 41%. So out of all of the, the usage of these categories, 40% um, of the time it was done through a mobile device. So we've seen that in, in most categories, the range is from 20 to 40%. Um, however, in, in city parks, the, the most frequented, it's, uh, it's around 57%. Um, another one of our findings is that there's a 10% higher bounce rate for uh, mobile usage than um, desktop. One of the, the key takeaways from this is that when, when going to uh, redesign your website, it's, it's really important to focus on um, the mobile usage uh, just because there's so much traffic being driven from there. Uh, so, after talking to some stakeholders, um, we found that the city of Pittsburgh is not fully utilizing uh, web traffic data in uh, the management of their website. Um, so our recommendation was that they should create multiple Google Analytics dashboards that will enable data-driven decisions concerning the management, content, and design of the website. Uh, so in our report, we wrote recommendations for multiple dashboards um, that are kind of like requirement documents and then the associated processes that go along with them so that they're actionable. Uh, so really the, the goal of our decision was to enable, uh, or the goal of our recommendations was to enable data-driven decisions. And how we did this is we identified a couple of high-impact questions uh, that then we uh, gave dashboard recommendations for how we, they can be used to answer that. Um, additionally, what, what we were hoping is that the dashboards can be used for continuous improvement through a constant monitor and modify approach where you're constantly uh, monitoring some key performance indicator, and then based off that, uh, modifying um, some aspect of the website. Um, additionally, we wanted to kind of start you down the path to being a little bit more data-driven when it comes to the management design and content um, that, that is on the website, as well as demonstrate the value of uh, analytics. And then finally, what we also wanted to do was highlight some of the best practices um, and processes for implementing analytics within an organization. Um, so quickly, just to, to kind of show you the format of some of these recommendations, um, we gave a, a, this one is the top search, term, top search terms dashboard, and it's a dashboard that's used to monitor the top search terms for the last 30 days. So in this case, the, the metrics are going to be the, the high impact question about what are the most commonly searched terms, and then the, the key performance indicator here is just the, the number of searches per term. And really the goal of this is to uh, align the SPJ topics in the quick search with the content that users are actually searching for. Um, and then 
you know, the other goal with that is that the, the Ask PGH topics can be updated in real time. So the process that, that goes along with this is really to monitor the dashboard and then f modify and uh, the Ask PGH topics so that they reflect what users are actually looking for. Uh, so now we're, we're going to hand it off to Alina Benger to go over the uh, user experience. <coughs> Hi, um, I'm Alina, and I was in charge of the user experience uh, design for this project. Uh, the primary goal of user experience is to incorporate the user's needs um, through research um, in the design. So uh, the first thing we did was research um, through surveys. Uh, we composed the survey out of seven questions, um, and using Google surveys, we distributed it on social media and through the website or so through the Pittsburgh PA uh, social media. And uh, it, it lasted about, it went, ran for about two weeks, um, and we had 188 responses, which I'd like to uh, let you know that that's technically a low response rate. Uh, in the future, for other research, you do want to get more and more uh, results. Uh, the more, the better, because then you can have a, a larger range of users and understand better the patterns and what's going on. Um, but 84 of the results, uh, one of the questions was, uh, why did you go to the website previously? And so we got to know the user, what, their, what were their previous needs? And so 84 of those uh, users responded manually, typed in their answers, and so we evaluated those results. Um, and based on the survey, the top items that they would like to see on a future website or a City of Pittsburgh website would be transit and parking, attractions, navigating the city, uh, fine, uh, learn about the fines, the taxes, utilities, jobs, and officials. Um, and that's, your website has all that information, it's just not always easy to find. Um, so what we did was uh, we took the 84 responses that the people wrote, uh, their previous needs, why they went to the website, and we organized them um, through pat by patterns, what was repeated, what's not, um, and we came with these categories, which are information. Uh, that was a big one. People wanted different kinds of information. It's very important that the website gives that information to the user. Uh, they were interested in licenses and tax information, job information, uh, parks and events, um, and garbage and other services as well. Um, and so that it's important that the website can illustrate that information easily for the user. Um, the usability research or observations, we came to 15 different users. These were uh, different age ranges uh, from 17 to, seven, to say 77. And um, these were strangers that um, may have never been to the website. Um, and actually, out of all of them, only three have heard of the website and two have been to the website. And uh, we asked them to perform two tasks. The first task was uh, to look up the garbage collection schedule in their area. And they can do it in any way, that, shape, or form they want to. The second task was to, do, uh, to find the dog license information, but they're not allowed to use the search tab or the search function or ask Pittsburgh. Um, and these are some of the results. Um, it took longer for the second task to complete. and. There was a lot of failure. What I mean by failure, it is people who gave up on the task. At some point, they either went back to search or they told me I can't do this. Um, and it took too long for them. Um, and that was interesting to see that it's difficult to navigate through the website. While the search function is very good, it's capable, people like it, it's easy, they rated it pretty high. So that was interesting information. Going forward, you want to do more and more observations and throughout the different stages of the building of the website, you want to have these uh, user groups, you can even bring them to you in this room, you can have them look at it, interact with it, see how they react. Oftentimes they give you feedback and it's interesting things. Um, and later in the, uh, in the wireframe portion, uh, when I present that in the prototype, I will explain some of the findings specifically from these um, conversations that I had with the users. Um, and one last thing is when I did observations, I've made sure to navigate, to record how much time it took them and what are the steps they took, what's the path that they took to get to the, to the point that they were trying to get to. Um, 
So based on that, uh, those two aspects of the research, I came up with the personas. Personas is an overall um, patterns that you see uh, among the users. You can create one user, the ideal user that represents all of these users. And I came up with four. For the purpose of this slide deck, I will show you um, just one of them. Um, I'll choose Ember. Uh, so it says that Ember is interested in one of the grad schools in Pittsburgh. Before she moves to Pittsburgh, she visits the city website to find out some important information. She's interested in information on the city's officials, the police records, the transit information, tax information, and general information about the city. Um, this area right here highlights the, some of the behaviors. Uh, is she more likely to use a search tool or navigate to the tabs? How much time does she have? Is she using a mobile device or a desktop? Um, and then is she looking for more fun attractions or professional services? These are behaviors um, for that age group or based on the users, um, the 188. Again, it was only 188 responses and 84 people responded um, what, that they have gone to the website and that they needed something previously. So you do want to do this in the future with a larger crowd uh, uh, to see more user information. And then the pain points are mostly from the observations, but um, there's too much information to look through. These are some feedbacks that I got. Um, she doesn't know what she needs, uh, and therefore she's frustrated uh, because it's not easily re understandable. Um, she can't navigate easily through a website. Um, and that is how you build a persona. Through the research, you come up with the um, pains, uh, the issues, and what they need. And now I'll give it over to Flory for social media. Okay, thanks, Alina. Um, so I worked on the social media team, uh, which is going to have some recommendations for the design of the website, as well as some other platforms you guys might want to look into. All right, so as the data analytics uh, report told you, we have about 6.57% uh, of the traffic coming to the website from social media sites, which is not a huge number. Um, they don't spend a lot of time. They usually visit one page, and then they leave. So on the mock-up, this is the way we have uh, the social media integrated onto the new site. And um, I have a few recommendations for how they might do it um, on the next incarnation of that. Um, so most social media is integrated into websites in this type of way. Um, kind of a minimal just using the symbol to represent each of the platforms. Uh, so that's Boston, Philadelphia, and Minneapolis. And usually there's just one little piece of writing that says, join the conversation, stay connected, that type of thing. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated because you need to have another level of, uh, or another area of icons uh, for feedback and sharing. I think the current city of uh, Pittsburgh website has them all together, and it's a little bit confusing to the user about what they're doing. Are they sharing the page? Are they liking your page? What are they doing? So it's really important that we have both of them and uh, that, they're sh that they are uh, clearly labeled so the, the user knows what they're doing. Um, you can also integrate it really nicely in there, not necessarily using the colors that people are used to seeing for Facebook, Twitter, or whatever, and it makes a really clean look. In the future, if you want to add more things than, say, like just Facebook, YouTube, or whatever, in the future, if it becomes necessary to have a ton of platforms, you can just add uh, this type of drop-down menu like that. Uh, this is from the city of Chicago. And then additionally, what will happen is if you click on it, there's a huge pop-out menu. You can scroll down. That's really great for mobile users. All right, so platform recommendations. One of the things that I really think you guys should think about doing in the future is uh, having one type of static visual medium, like Instagram or Flickr. That's what a lot of sites feature right now. Um, and then I also think it would be really great if you guys uh, took stewardship of your LinkedIn page. Um, so this is just from the city of Boston. And you can see they have a nice little banner up there. And they have little updates where they publish their content. So if you guys wanted to put up a job description, that type of thing, um, you can connect with all these people who have their resumes up who are following you already. Um, you currently have 3,241 followers, which is awesome. That's people who are interested in what you're updating, who are interested in the jobs you're posting. All you would have to do is just go back to um, City of Boston and see how they have a nice banner photo, which I'm sure you guys have, and then just publish the content that you're publishing on your Facebook, your YouTube, and whatever else, just through this channel. And also, you can update your job, uh, your job profiles. Um, 
So it'd be really awesome uh, to see this type of static thing, like a uh, city of Philadelphia has photographers that they publish from events. Um, city of Boston has an Instagram. And it's really nice because you're engaging with people in kind of a, uh, a way that promotes the things that your city is doing in a way that a lot of young people look at, and also the way that a lot of creative people like, uh, interact with it. Perhaps you don't have someone who's going to create those kind of official photos right now. Uh, something that the city of New York has done is create kind of a directory of all these different official channels. So you can say, like, the Pittsburgh Penguins, all these official legitimate channels are publishing content, and you can direct people to them. Um, and that would be like a link on the page. Um, another thing that might be interesting to add uh, as an app for the website is um, printing and PDF apps. That might be really helpful for people who are going to the page, uh, looking for one piece of information, they want to send it to maybe an older person who wasn't as computer literate, and just print or uh, send it in a PDF form. All right, up next is contents government. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tiffany Carruthers, and this is Bradley Smertz. Uh, we, were, we were working together on content management and governance, and uh, we are primarily concerned with the publishing, management, and maintenance of content that goes on your site. Um, so our, the overview of what, what our group um, went over is content publishing, how new content is added to your website content management system features. Right now, you, you guys are using an, a little bit of an older system, and we were trying to go over that and see if there might be some better systems available for you out there. And then we also, what the ADA 501B standards, which is uh, trying to make your website up to standards for users with disabilities. And then uh, testing of the CMS, uh, microsite governance, and training for new employees. So our first recommendation, and probably the, uh, the highest priority of what we are recommending for content management, is to hire a content manager to um, go through and approve new content that's going to be published. And this, this person would be working with all 13 departments. Right now, the way the system is set up is certain people are able to publish content from each different department. And also, the web development team uh, can, develop, can publish content as well and it's kind of a, a little bit inconsistent throughout the 13 departments. So this person would be in charge of uh, editing and grammatical checking of new content that's added, uh, as well as image files, media files. Um, this person would be in charge of making sure that all new content is ADA compliant for your users with disabilities. And it establishes a two-person authoritative process, meaning that if somebody writes a, a blurb to put in, then there's going to always be somebody to edit that content and make sure that it meets your quality standards for the website. Um, this person would also be involved with microsites and making sure that, that content is also approved. And this, another really good benefit of this is that you, it creates consistency throughout your website. And that, that's kind of the primary goal of content management. And then I passed out a features matrix. There's a few at the front of the room if people wanted to grab one on their way out. Uh, this compares your current content management system with one that's a homebrew system that your web development team is creating, and then two popular CMS uh, systems, which is Drupal and Microsoft SharePoint. All, three of the, all four of the systems and the three that we're comparing for future use are free if you have the um, if you have a, a policy with the Microsoft, and you guys do, um, some, of the, some of the things that we're looking at, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but they were just basically things that we found with content publishing that could go a little bit better, uh, which for one would be what we talked about earlier, making sure that there is uh, somebody editing the content. Uh, and then, so our next recommendation is whatever content management system that you choose, that you use it on a microsite before you use it on, uh, on your new website. And this will allow you to be able to figure out what features that you need, maybe features that aren't working well, or some usability issues for people that are uh, managing your content. And then 
So this this also ties in with having a content manager manager content manager, and this is developing an ADA compliance plan. And this is, right now I did a, an assessment of your website, just the home page, and checked for errors for ADA compliance, which would be contrast errors for pe that for, might make it difficult for people with visual impairments to be able to read. And then it also, some of the other things that are really important for ADA compliance is being able to be adaptable to screen readers, so people that aren't able to, to read through images can have it read out to them. So as you can see, there were a lot of errors that are found, and this is a, a thing that you can really improve upon to help out those users that have disabilities. And creating a plan that uh, every time you upload new content, it's just you are doing the, the specific things that need to be followed to adhere to that. And this would also, that person who is the content manager would be well aware of these policies. And then hand it off to Brad. All right, thank you, Tiffany. All right, so in regard to more of the governance side of things, um, we do have a recommendation in regard to employee training. Uh, so our recommendation is that finalize the already existing training wiki. Uh, I was provided with the training wiki, and I believe that it's actually structured very well, and it's uh, very structured in such a way that the usability is easy. Um, and I also would recommend that we mandate, you guys mandate that the wiki be the primary source of training. Um, how it stands now, I believe that the web, web development team is responsible with training new employees, but I feel like a wiki that includes ample screenshots can do the same job and at the same time some of the benefits that this would uh, provide would be freeing up time for the web development team to perform their primary duties um, and provide a comprehensive list of readily available instructions kind of more in layman's terms uh, so the employees can kind of uh, relate to each other in that way. Uh, the next recommendation that we have to make is in regard to the microsite, uh, microsite approval process. Uh, so we recommend that make strict guidelines public to educate applicants on definite no situations. Uh, so for my research, I researched uh, the guidelines of basically 10 to 12 other cities, uh, and they have these guidelines online through an application form uh, that basically say do not apply for a microsite under these conditions no matter what. So uh, it will save the mayor's office time by not having to sift through clearly unqualified applicants um, and it'll be like an easy process for applicants as well. And another recommendation we'd like to make is in regard to microsite content management. Uh, so we recommend, like Tiffany had mentioned, that have a representative from each microsite be trained through the wiki uh, in regard to the CMS as well. Uh, in our formal report, I uh, do have a table of contents and recommended um, areas of the wiki, uh, but I'll provide comprehensive glossary to limit uh, misinterpretation across the departments, which is one of the major problems um, under having one content manager review everything. Um, and a representative at City of Pittsburgh will oversee, like she had mentioned, the content and stylistic aspects. Uh, some of the benefits that this will provide is that it will enable more relevant information to be uploaded in a timely fashion, therefore hopefully increasing site traffic, um, and then the microsites will uh, appear to be more uniform in regard to style as well. Let's pass it off to content architecture, Jacob and Eric. Thank you guys. Hi, my name is Eric. This is Jacob. We did a little work on content architecture for you today. Are you still with us? Yes. You're doing great. This is an awful lot of information. We understand that. Uh, please understand, though, that you will be getting the report, which will help uh, kind of solidify all this. You'll be able to look at it. Um, we did a, a quite a bit of work, and, and I think you'll, you'll see some of it's uh, really pointing in the directions we were talking about. So any good presentation like this, we sort of tell you what we're going to tell you, we tell you, and our job is in, in some ways to tell you what we told you. So some of this is going to seem like we're wrapping up here and we're going to point it towards some of the wireframes and some of the things that we've created for you. So we're going to move on here. Uh, first of all, the standards of evaluation. Um, Deborah Lamb, in, in our initial meetings with the city, co commented specifically on the code for the America's Front Door Digital Initiative, right? Uh, and we wanted to talk a little bit about that today. We also wanted to talk about the best of breed benchmark websites that we looked at and bounced your stuff off of, specifically Louisville and uh, Philadelphia and what Philadelphia is doing. So the design principles for the Digital Front Door Initiative. First of all, universal access, uh, accessibility, ADA compliance. We've talked a little bit about that already. Digital services, providing them, treating residents with dignity, and establishing a sense of place, which we're going to talk about in just a second. Uh, 
So summary of issues. Once again, we're kind of summarizing what some of our colleagues have already talked about. ADA compliance is an issue. Uh, overloading the user with information. Uh, web archiving for news stories. We're going to talk about that in a second. It's a big deal. We need to think about that for what we're going to do here. Uh, no social media hub. The organization of the page, the consistency of the layout, redundancy of site searching, and uh, lack of digital services. These are some of the summary. This is sort of just an overall of what we saw. And the main thing here is that w the current site has some issues with the average resident in mind. And that's where we really want to point this to. We want the average resident to be able to use the site as effectively as possible. And that really hooks into those front door initiatives. And that's why we, we kind of made that a point. Um, ADA compliance. We've talked about this for a second. There's just one thing I wanted to point out specifically. Um, this link here, let me see if I can get the cool laser to work. Yes. Suspicious and redundant links. This may seem strange to you. Suspicious is the city of Pittsburgh. We don't have suspicious things on our website. Absolutely not. But those links in screen readers may read link. If you or I were on a website and we saw something that just said link, we probably wouldn't click it. We want some description of what it is. So when we say suspicious or redundantly, that's what we're talking about. If I'm using a screen reader, if I'm using JAWS, if I'm using something like that, that comes up as link. So we got to make sure we, we, we have some, uh, you know, some, some alt tags in there, some descriptions of links so that people know what they're, what they're clicking on. So we talk a little bit about those, those features here. Uh, contrast errors for low vision folks was another thing. Those were the two big ones that we found. Um, Okay, information overload. Too many organizational tabs across the top here. Uh, this was something that we found. Uh, eight scrolling news stories, awful lot of information. But the real cinder in the stew for us were the hundreds of news stories, literally hundreds of news stories on the main page. Uh, I stopped counting at 200 when I did the content inventory. So that's something to, to think about there. Archiving that, obviously. Uh, in comparison, a site that we saw that we benchmarked that we were pretty happy with, Louisville. Only five tabs across the top, two, two news stories. news stories, yes, and then a place to view more after that. This was something that we thought was much more streamlined and made a lot of sense. Um, if we move on, Philadelphia, similar kind of thing. Uh, small number of tabs across the top, uh, three news stories across the bottom. So that's something that we were looking into. Um, news accuracy, no web archive right now. News stories from a full two years ago still available on the site. That's an issue to think about. Um, archiving on Louisville. So what we did was we looked at Louisville, which is one of our benchmark sites, and we said, okay, how are they doing this well? Only the two newest with a view all. We talked a little bit about that. And we've also got over here this great search capability when you do go to their archive. You can look keyword, date range, departmental field, really great way for people to use the actual site. So we thought that was a, a really a good recommendation. Streamline the homepage, quickly archive old news stories. And in the, uh, the report, we've got some specific numbers where we tell you what we're, what we're thinking about in that regard. Um, moving on, organization of homepage. Um, Jargon, always an issue, as we know. Uh, PAFR, CAFR, looking through these, what exactly do these things mean to the average resident? Uh, what do some of them mean to any of us? Okay, so exactly. Redesigning the tabs. And once again, we go into this idea of organizing for the residents. Digital front door, uh, that's, that's what they're looking at, that's what we're looking at. And we understand that some jargon is going to be inevitable because this is a government website, but we recommend that you add in either some more description or when possible just avoid the more jargony bits of jargon that's on the current website to make it more accessible to the average resident. Absolutely. Uh, Louisville structures their situation in who you are. Are you a resident, business, government, city service, or visitor? Pretty easy way to move throughout the, the site. Uh, Philly takes a little bit of a different, what do you want to do? Report a problem, uh, pay a bill, find a job, search property. Okay, so we actually kind of like Louisville's a little more, the who are you, but this is another option for you as well, and they're both outlined in the report. You can check out and see what you like best. Um, consistency of layout in the tabs. Uh, organizational tabs are inconsistently laid out right now. Only one tab divides into subcategories, makes it a little tricky to move around. That's an issue that we had, especially when doing the inventory. Um, looking once again at our benchmark sites, 
Uh, consistency across all tabs regardless of content was what we found when we looked at Louisville. And you can kind of see an example of how that looks here. And once again, we have links to that in the report. You can look at that more closely. But you can just see right on the screen how that looks. And that's something that we struck us. That's something we feel pretty strongly about just because as the current tabs are, there's a lot of good information there, but it's very hard to parse through because the tabs are all laid out so differently. Exactly. Redundancy and site searching. Uh, we talked a little bit with some of your folks already about the Ask Pittsburgh and what we're doing with that, so we won't drive that into the ground. But Ask right next to Search is a little confusing. Um, maybe something to look at re reorganizing there. We would definitely recommend that there is a reorganization of that. Um, most digital services are related to 311 uh, and using city parks facilities. Other digital services we found a little bit hard to find, a little bit hard to track down. Um, we've got some examples talking a little bit about the, uh, the, the dog licensing, the refuse pickup, those types of things. Not labeled always for city residents, uh, buried in long menus. Once again, something that we would recommend um, dealing with. Um, establishing a sense of place was something that uh, the current website does a really good job of and we would love to see more of this. Uh, I'm, fr I'm, a, I'm a Pittsburgher. I'm, I'm from here. I realize that we are um, fiercely provincial and insanely self-referential. So to me, I love this. I want to see this. I want to see our name. I want to see the crest. I want to see that we're livable. I want to see the skyline. To me, that's wonderful. It establishes the sense of place that the Digital Front Door Initiative really pointed out. And we love that. We want to take that a little further. Uh, the unique features about the city need to continue in this way. So more like this is really where we wanted to uh, go with that. Uh, you, you, you're, you're really getting somewhere with the sense of place. Keep that moment momentum up. Um, and here we've got our recommendations. We broke it into three parts for you. Compliance, specifically dealing with ADA issues. The layout, we talked a little bit about that. And then content. One specific thing we wanted to mention, switch to a CMS with an automatic archiving function for those news stories. That's going to make a world of difference for someone looking on that main page. Uh, establish a default amount of time that news stories spend on the front page. Um, and as, as Jacob pointed out, avoiding the, uh, the, the jargon when possible really helps as well. Um, we're going to talk a little bit now about some of the, the wireframes that we've got here. We're actually going to pass it over to Alina, and she's going to demonstrate a prototype that she marked up for you guys of putting some of our recommendations for kind of architecture into action. Hi again. So first of all, this is our original uh, wireframe. What we started with was five changes. We just wanted to let you know, let it start going easy, start the roll ball, ball rolling. <laughs> So the first thing is, and it was mentioned, um, we only had several tabs here um, instead of the original um, number of tabs. We only have a few. And then we took the, the links that were on the side and put them as buttons. But, um, and then we, um, the main thing is you only have three scrolls. Uh, you go second page and third page, and that's it. And there's a big um, uh, footer with lots more information. There's three news, and there's a fixed div that has the search bar, easy access, and um, social media, 311, contact us. So this is the prototype, and it should be clickable. It is, okay. So the main thing is that uh, there is now a weather application here rather than just snow. Uh, you could put snow warning in there as well. It could be a fixed uh, location. Uh, not fixed, but on, on top. You have this fixed bar right here. Um, where you have the Google Translate, it has to be consistent. It can't be, somebody thought it was a search bar in one of the usability uh, results. Contact us, 311, and big search right here. Um, this is, if you scroll down, it will remain a fixed div. This is a second scroll page. You have several of the news stories. Um, again, we don't want old news. We want just um, three, cat you can have three categories. You can have it more than three, but make sure they're organized. And if you click on them, then you can read the full story. You have the little blurb. Um, and the div up here remains so that you can still go to search any point. Um, and then based on the, similar to the, um, the website for Louisville, we have the resident, the business, the government, and visitor. Uh, this allows you to have very specific information for those users. And if you scroll down one more, you get the big um, bottom, uh, this fixed, uh, not fixed, sorry, <laughs> this uh, footer 
has the logo and has um, all kinds of information. Yeah, we, we knew that you were very concerned about having a, a portal for your employees. They need to use this site as well. We think that footer is a fantastic place to put anything where they would be uh, needing to enter a specific area of the site. And that would work really well for uh, non-employee users of the site as well. And if we go back up here, we'll show you that this now has the most important uh, links. Um, and you have also the most popular tab. So this shows you the community link. You have the Pits Pits Pittsburgh business. You have services and schedules, uh, city information, and community. Does this work? Uh, we have the most popular, um, and this is al alphabetized, which is very important because now it's easy to find. One of the things we saw is that people missed the animal control, can control, because on the actual website it is all the way in the bottom, it's hidden, and people, um, when they looked for dog licenses, they went to licenses, permits, and uh, registration, and they got really lost there, or not registration, whatever the other one was. Uh, but if you scroll down and you click on the resident, you have information on the, for the resident, for the businessman, for the government person. And you can change this information, but it's, this makes your website very organized. It is short. Uh, it all has only three scrolls. And it addresses the typical user, but it also has, based on your dashboard, you can have the most popular links, uh, which are quick, easy access. The mobile version will allow you um, to have a little quick links here. So, um, and that, if you click on it, um, it has the information right there, quickly and accessible. And then the last thing I want to show, too, um, one of the things I noticed is for the Department of Public Works, people miss this link, the PGH.ST. It looks like an image. People skip through it. So make a button here and organize the material differently. Um, and then with that, thanks. That's pretty much it that we have for today. Um, we're open to taking any questions or hearing any comments that you have. Um, thank you very much for your time today. We really appreciate it.